All right, well, let's turn our Bibles to Philippians, book of Philippians, chapter 3. Philippians, chapter 3. Paul here says, verse number 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. We see here that the Apostle Paul says, finally. He's about to give the church at Philippi a uh, practical conclusion to his letter. Uh, this is kind of like saying, uh, listen up or pay attention. Uh, what is the important point that Paul is trying to make to the church at Philippi? Well, what he's trying to show us is that whatever circumstances we may find ourselves in, we need to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He says, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Paul says here, it may seem like I'm repeating myself, but I don't mind saying it over and over again, and you all need to keep hearing it over and over again. You think about it when you get in a car, with all of our kids, you know, Sunday was kind of interesting. Uh, Heather went home, and I went home, and uh, all of a sudden we got a call from the church, and they broke in the back door, and we left uh, little Jenny and little Zach here. <laughs> you know, Heather didn't count her numbers, and I didn't count my numbers, and we didn't get together. But they were okay. They had plenty of food here. We came back and got them. But, uh, but every time you get in the car... You know, if we're together, Heather likes to say all the names and call roll just to make sure we didn't leave anybody behind, especially when we're on our, on our trips. But you get in a car, and you say, buckle up, buckle up. And you say it over, and you say it over and over and over again. Why is that? Uh, because you want to make sure your kids are safe, and if nothing else, you want to make sure if you get pulled over or there's a road check, you don't get a fine. Buckle up, buckle up, buckle up. So we see in the book of Philippians that Paul keeps saying something over and over and over again. And he says, it doesn't grieve me to say this. I don't get tired of saying this. And he says here, for you, it is for your well-being. And that phrase and that theme that Paul keeps saying over and over and over again is rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And this is something that I need. And this is something that you need to be reminded of. Whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, we need to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as we think about the word rejoice, this is not a superficial cheerfulness, but it's a positive attitude of joy that comes to a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, some people, and I don't know if it's fully warranted, but they make a difference between happiness and joy. Uh, they say happiness is temporal, where joy is eternal. Happiness is a feeling. Joy is a fact. Uh, one of the things that is true is that happiness can be felt in sin, but joy cannot be felt in sin. You know, you say to yourself, well, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That's Philippians 4.4, 4, that's the theme verse of the book of Philippians. You say, well, that may work for Paul, but can it work in my life? Well, let's look at Paul's life and see what Paul was going through. Chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, Paul says, But I would have you to understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel, so that in my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace." And in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now the word we see repeated there is the word bonds. Which means as Paul is saying rejoice in the Lord. Or rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Where is he at? He's in prison. And he's not in a prison that's... Uh, you know, regulated by the prison standards we have today, he's in a cruel Roman prison. 
And uh, we see here his attitude. He says, well, you know, here in the, the prison, there are the, the palace guards, you know, have uh, received Christ as Savior. He says, here are other Christians who are also going through persecution, are encouraged because of what I'm going through. And so we see here Paul taking what we would consider a bad situation, being in a Roman prison, and saying, you know what? This has actually fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. And so whatever we're going through, you know, we can say we're not in a Roman prison. And whatever we're going through, we can say that this is somehow, if we give it to the Lord, going to be used for the furtherance of his gospel. We see something else in verses 15 through 18. He says, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding, in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. What's going on here? I guess... According to this passage, we have some people that are preaching Christ of envy and strife. We have some people preaching, supposing to add affliction to his bonds. Uh, in other words, there's some preachers who are behind Paul, and there's some preachers who perhaps are saying, well, you know what, if Paul was more faithful to Christ, maybe he wouldn't be in the situation he's in. Maybe he wouldn't be in that prison there. And what is Paul's reaction? Well, he says, well, I know some of these guys who are saying bad things about me, and uh, they're, they're preaching Christ, and so I rejoice. I rejoice in this. And he even says that very clearly in verse 18. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. I've made up my mind. You know, I don't care what other people are saying about me. I am going to rejoice in the Lord always. So we see circumstances that Paul finds himself in, in prison. What does he do? He rejoices. We see personalities who are, who are criticizing him and saying bad things about him and running down his ministry and him. What does he do? He chooses to rejoice. Well, what else do we see? Verses 20 through 24. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. You know, what is Paul uh, saying here? He's saying here that he understands the truth that in this prison he is living under the constant threat of perhaps being put to death. Death. He's at death's door. And he understands the threat of death in his life. Yeah, you know, what does he say when he considers the threat of death in his life? And, you know, for him it was being in a Roman prison. For him, you know, even if he was, you know, set free, you had these, you know, Jewish people that were going around and oppressing him wherever he went, and you had these pagans which were opposing the gospel. But he was always under the threat of death. And yet, what does he say? While I live, I will live for Christ, and when I die, I will be with Christ. <laughs> for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And so what does he do once again? Even under the threat of death, he's rejoicing. He's like that old preacher, John R. Rice. He said, if anyone ever stuck a gun to him, he said, you know what I'm going to say to him? How can you threaten me with heaven? <laughs> and so he realized this is a reality in the life of the Apostle Paul. All right, what else? Verses 27 through 30. Only let your conversation or citizenship be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, 
with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me also. So what else is going on in Paul's life? He has adversaries. He has opponents. He's suffering affliction. And he tells the people at Philippi, you know, when people oppose you, then uh, what you need to do is you need to not be terrified by it, not be startled by it. And then when they see your calmness and they see God's peace and God's joy in the midst of persecution, in the midst of adversity, Guess who becomes terrified and afraid? They do. <laughs> because they see something in your life which is supernatural. And something like, wow, he must really believe this stuff that he's preaching. Because he really believes in this Christ who's risen from the dead. And that Christ is going to take care of him as well. So all of these things. He's in prison. He's got people criticizing. He's under the threat of death. He's facing adversity. Yet in all of this stuff, he can say what? Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. What is it? What is it that causes him to be this way? Well, as we go to Philippians chapter 2, we see here in verses 1 through 11 that Paul considers what Christ has done for him. And as he considers what Christ has done for him, Paul then wanted to be like Christ. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, If there therefore be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill me, ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Fulfill ye my joy. This is what makes me joyful. And that is for you to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And he remembered, verse number 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He remembered Christ. He remembered what Christ had done for him, and that caused him to rejoice. But something else. He also looked and he saw the impact of Christ on those to whom he had the privilege of ministering. That also caused him to have joy. Look at verse 14. He's speaking to the church of Philippi. He says, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Paul focused on, uh, on Christ, and he saw what Christ had done for him, it caused him to rejoice. And now he's focusing on those to whom he ministers Christ. And as he sees God working in their lives, what does he do? He rejoices. And he says, rejoice with me that God is doing this in your lives. No matter what we're going through, if we keep our eyes on Christ and what he is doing, we will not lose our joy. You know, what does that mean? You know, I think about you know, the COVID and all that COVID has brought about 
in our lives. And, uh, you know, you're, you're tempted to think. You're tempted to think about, you know, before COVID. Everything was moving along and everything seemed to be going forward. And all of a sudden the COVID hit. And, and God just shut it all down. He shut it all down. And you're tempted to look even at ministry. They were saying that a lot of people in pastoral ministry right now are just feeling burned out and feeling depressed because for most people, the numbers just haven't bounced back you know, after the COVID pandemic. There are a lot of people going through this. People have just frankly gotten out of the habit of coming to church or they're still afraid of the COVID or whatever. And so how do you apply that to that situation? You know, how do you apply it? you know, in your personal life. Well, what you do is you remember Christ. You keep your focus on Christ and you stay close to Christ. You're in his word. You're praying and asking for strength. You're walking with him. And then you look around and you say, you know what? Here are some people that I have an impact on for Christ. And I can see Christ working in this situation. And I'm going to choose to rejoice in those opportunities and those people in whom Christ is working. You know, we had prayer requests tonight, you know, for this, this lady that Heather gave a, a book to, a gospel book, you know, and, and she's going back and following up and saying, have you read it yet? You know, that's, that's a blessing to hear that. That's a, a light in whom God is working. You know, I think about uh, the young man who comes on Sunday nights and most Wednesday nights, sits on the front row here. He's not here tonight. But uh, God allowing us to pour our lives, you know, into him. You think about uh, the children that you minister to day in and day out. Children, maybe you don't minister to them anymore because they're not in your home, but you, you pray for and you just uh, you, you counsel as God gives opportunity or grandchildren or other family members that you're able to minister to. Just doing those things from day to day, they glorify God even if it's just your duty that God has given you in your life. And you can rejoice in how God is using you in the lives of others. Here's a challenging verse or passage that God showed me some time back. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Verses 16 through 22. Jesus says to his disciples, A little while and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us, A little while, and you shall not see me? And again, a little while, and you shall see me, and because I go to the Father. And they said, Therefore, What is this that he saith, A little while? For we cannot tell what he says. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while and ye shall not see me and again a little while and ye shall see me? <laughs> verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament but the world shall rejoice and ye shall be sorrowful but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman when she is in travail has sorrow because her hour is come but as soon as she is delivered of the child she remembereth no more the anguish. For joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice. And this last phrase. Is something that's always stuck with me. And your joy no man taketh from you. Now the context here is Christ getting ready to go to the cross. And he's going to die. And he's going to be buried for three days and three nights. And there's going to be lots of sorrow. You remember, what are the disciples going to do? They're going to go in that upper room, you know, afraid. What are we going to do next? You know, our teacher is gone. Our Lord is, is gone. But then just like a woman giving birth, once you put that baby in her arms, you know, she forgets about the sorrow and the pain, and she rejoices that she's brought this life into the world. In the same way, they're going to be sorrowful. And yet the world is rejoicing that Jesus is dead. But then that third day, he's going to rise from the dead. And when they see the resurrected Christ, when they see him, when they touch him, you know, John says in 1 John, we've handled him. 
And when they see him and touch him and see him eat, that it's not just a spirit, but it's his glorified body come back from the dead. They're going to rejoice. And once they have that experience with Christ, the living Christ, no one is going to be able to take that joy from them. Well, as we walk with the living Christ, if we do not have the joy that we ought to have, it's not because of anything except the fact that it's not that anyone took it from us. You know, look at Paul. He's in prison. Paul, he's got people criticizing him. Paul, he's at the point of death. Paul has many adversities and adversaries. And yet he says what? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. No one takes our joy from us. But because of sin and disobedience and our lack of walk with the Lord, sometimes we give up that joy. Let's look at 1 Kings. Let's go over here to 1 Kings. And we'll kind of, this will be where we end up. 1 Kings, chapter number 19. Chapter number 19. You think about the Mount of Transfiguration. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, who are the two people that appeared with Jesus? Moses. Yep. Elijah. Moses and Elijah. That's right. Um, the two witnesses in Revelation, you know, uh, I think, you know, the first one can be argued about. Some people say Enoch because Enoch never died. Some people say Moses. Uh, but that second witness in Revelation that's going to come down and do wondrous works and be killed and resurrected, it's pretty sure that one of them is Elijah. I mean, Elijah is the king of the prophets. I mean, he's just this great, great man. And yet in chapter 19, in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, he had just had a wonderful victory on Mount Carmel. You know, all the prophets of Baal were there, and, you know, they were trying to call down fire from heaven, and he was mocking them, and, you know, he just prayed a simple prayer and fire came down and he put water on the altar. It licked up the water, even burned up the altar. And he killed the prophets of Baal. And yet, in verse number 2, it says, Then Jezebel, remember she was the wicked queen, sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time one of those slain prophets of Baal. And when he saw that, he arose, and what it should say here is, he went right up into Jezebel's face and said, you're not going to touch me unless God allows you to touch me. That's what he should have done. But he didn't. He did what we would have done. And went for his life. He ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. What's going on here? Elijah was so distraught that he wanted to die. Why is it? One of the things he did here is he got his eyes on his circumstances. And he saw that Jezebel was trying to kill him. And he just defeated you know, all of these prophets of Baal. And yet, maybe he was burned out at that moment. And he just he feared at the words of Jezebel at that moment. We see he had self-pity, verses 13 and 14. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? You know, what are you doing here in the middle of nowhere, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous, jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because of the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. You know, what in the world's going on here? Not only is he focused on his circumstances, but he's focused on himself and self-pity. You know, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one doing anything for you, Lord. You know, that's one of the great things I like about traveling out west. 
is we get to be in these different churches out west. And we see where God is moving. Go to a little city like Cody, Wyoming. And there's at least four gospel churches there. <laughs> and it's just amazing. The one we went to is, was thriving in Wapiti, Wisconsin, Wyoming. It's just amazing. Go to Fresno, California. Someone told Heather, she said, well, we went all the way to the West Coast, went to California. And she said, you weren't scared? <laughs> and uh, Heather said, no. You know, I guess some people think you go to California and they're there to just do something to you if you're a Christian with conservative values. I don't know. But no, but, but Fresno, California, where we went to church, you know, a thriving church, you know, there. And there are other thriving churches in Fresno, California, and throughout California, you know, the big... West Coast Baptist College, Lancaster Baptist Church, and you know you got the big ministries there. You know John MacArthur has a big ministry, Grace Church uh, down there, and, and different. There's all kind of ministries of different stripes. People are preaching the gospel, standing for biblical values, and uh, but that's the way we get in it. Like Elijah, well, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. You know, I think of uh, Heather's. You know, as a mother, you know, and you think, well, am I the only one? You know, going through raising six kids and all of this stuff, and yet there, there are others out there. You know, and we, we get that. You know, we, we look at circumstances, and we look at, you know, our situation that we're in, and we, we self-pity. And yet, you know, in, in the verses previous to this, what had God done? He had appeared to Elijah in power, and then finally in that still small voice in verse number 12. And so in verse number uh, 14... Or verse number 15, it says, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. You know, what's, what's going on here? God said, all right, you know, you've had time, Elijah, you know, to, uh, to, to relax. You know, here he was. He'd been in the wilderness. And I think he uh, just wanted to die. You know, it's like someone on a bridge, you know, jumping off the bridge. You know, you go on these bridges. We went over the uh, Eads Bridge in, in St. Louis. We walked halfway over it because it had a walking place on it. And, uh, you know, these bridges in these big cities. We went over the Ben Franklin Bridge once in Philadelphia. They had these signs on them. It says, if you're suicidal, you know, uh, call this number. You know, these beautiful bridges. And they have these signs on them because people... I guess they're jumping off these bridges. Well, that's kind of what I think Elijah did. He went out in the wilderness. He knew he went one way. You know, he wouldn't have food. He wouldn't have water. He would die out there of dehydration. And yet God in the wilderness, because he was his child, brought him a cake, brought him some water. He ate. He drank. He laid down. And then after he was rested up and God had refreshed him, he says, you know what? You need to anoint this person to be king over this country and anoint this person to be prophet in your stead. What did he do? He gave him a task to do. He gave Elijah a task. And we have to ask ourselves a question. You know, what is the task at hand that God has for us at this moment? I think about Miss Kim, you know, taking care of her mother. That's a task at hand. That is a, a very important task. And my wife taking care of the kids and her mother. It's a task at hand. Think about the task at hand that we have as uh, just Christians. You know, the Great Commission. You know, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And what's that last phrase? And lo... I, the one who has all authority, all power over heaven and earth, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. And then in verse 18, God reminds him of what he's still doing. 
It says, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. And you know, as I think about that, I wonder how many of those 7,000, you know, were personally impacted by the prophet Elijah. <laughs> and, and God may be reminding him here, here's what I've done through you in the past. And I'm getting ready to do more things through you and through your protege, Elisha, in the future. Why is it so important? Why is it so important in the midst of life's trials that we can and we must rejoice in the Lord? Why do I need to be reminded of that? Why do we all need to be reminded of this? Well, there's a passage in Nehemiah, and I guess we'll turn there. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. And it's one that we sing in Sunday school sometimes. There's a little song that goes with it. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. In the midst of a building program, in the midst of opposition, as the word of God is being read and explained by Ezra and by his men, it says in verse number 10 of Nehemiah 8, then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry. And here's that last line. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's so important. You know, Paul says in Philippians 3, 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4, 4, that theme verse, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And Paul is not someone who has an easy life here. What are those things? You know, in prison, being criticized, at the point of death, many adversities. And yet he chooses not to focus on circumstances, he chooses not to have self-pity, but instead he chooses to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this day, that's where our focus needs to be as well. May God's Holy Spirit help us to fulfill that.